George Galloway, Workers' Party of Britain candidate, 12,003. I do hereby declare that George Galloway is duly... respect the Prime Minister, I despise the Prime Minister. Just suck it up. I won the election. Bonkers Baerbock issues the most obscene, offensive publication ever seen in Berlin since 1945. The Pope tells Zelensky, hoist the white flag and sue for peace with Russia. Joe Biden wants to build a pier. May take a few months before we can land any significant aid into Gaza. I wonder what he meant by that, and 40 years on, Arthur Scargill is still the main man at the anniversary commemoration in Doncaster yesterday, where hundreds of people queued outside the venue to hear the master, the working class hero of all time, tell how the miners marched into history and joined the pantheon of people's heroes all over the world. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night because this is the mother of all talk shows. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. George Galloway. The mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway, the world is our classroom, and you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. Bunkers Baerbock, the unhinged green foreign minister of the ailing Federal Republic of Germany, actually issued a Ramadan message this evening in which she said that she was heartfelt sending a signal to all those in Gaza, suffering from Hamas terrorism. It is unbelievable the tone deafness of these Western politicians. They imagine that the 112,000 people who are either dead, maimed, mutilated, or buried under the rubble inside Gaza are the victims of Hamas rather than the victims of their ally, Israel, with their full support, economic support, political support, cultural support in the Eurovision Song Contest, military support with weapons and intelligence overflights and all the rest. They really seem to believe that, that anybody in the entire Muslim world wants to hear a Ramadan message from the foreign minister of Germany blaming Hamas for 112,000 murdered and mutilated Muslim people. I'll tell you what, Germany, get rid of this woman. She's making your country a laughing stock as well as an economic basket case. Germany, the powerhouse of Europe, is now the sick man of Europe as a result of following the orders of senile, butcher, genocide, Joe Biden, to whom I now turn. 
Joe Biden, who could, with a single phone call, tell Israel to open the gates and allow thousands upon thousands of fully laden trucks full of aid, some of it now spoiling. It's been standing out in the Sinai desert for so long. He could phone Netanyahu and tell him, open the gates or there won't be another dollar. There won't be another dime. There won't be another bomb, another gun, another shell, another air force, another piece of diplomatic maneuvering on your behalf in the United Nations. Open the gates now. No, Joe Biden thinks that anyone's going to buy his solution that a thousand American soldiers go to the Gaza Strip. What could possibly go wrong, Joe? What could possibly happen to your thousand soldiers? If the Israelis don't kill them, the Palestinian resistance will kill them. A thousand American soldiers to the Gaza Strip, a raging war zone, to do what? To build a harbor which will take six to eight weeks, they say, so that they could sail aid directly into the Gaza Strip. Why didn't anybody think of that? It could have been done any day, sending barges from the ships onto the beach. We don't need a harbor. And anyway, maybe you've got an ulterior motive for your harbor, Genocide Joe. Maybe you want to build that harbor so you can steal the oil and gas in the sea off Gaza, which belongs to the Palestinian Authority. Maybe you want to do in Gaza what you are already doing in Syria, in the parts of Syria that you remain in illegal occupation of, looting them of their oil in great profusion. The Pope has told Zelensky it's time to hoist the white flag. Q outrage amongst the NAFO brigade all over the world. But what His Holiness is saying is enough is enough. Ukraine has lost this war. Hundreds of thousands of people have lost their lives in this war. Hundreds of billions of euros and dollars have been wasted on this war. And the only result of continuing to fight it is that more and more Ukrainian territory will be lost. More and more millions of Ukrainian citizens will fly to other countries as refugees and settle there. Not much liked, they will come to be amongst the public that they have been dropped in amongst. Trust me on that. And remember, you heard it here. All the Pope is saying is enough is enough. Who will doubt it? Who's going to call for the continuation of the fight to the last drop of Ukrainian blood? Has enough Ukrainian blood not already been shed? Any losing cause? Any war that need never have happened, should never have happened? Any war that was provoked, not by the Ukrainians themselves, but by their NATO masters? Washington declared the war over the dead bodies of Ukrainians, a proxy war against Russia, and they were open about their war aims. They wanted to regime change Moscow. They wanted to break Russia up into what they call its constituent parts. Not one Russia, but a balkanized Russia, dozens of Russias, little statelets, that they could maneuver and conspire within, turning one against the other, having all build a state, an army, an air force, having all build all the paraphernalia of antagonistic states. They didn't hide it. That was their intention. And the fact that they didn't hide it is the principal reason why Russia has prevailed. If you tell a country that you intend to break it up, that you intend to pick its government, that you intend to redraw its borders, that you intend to feast upon the dripping roast of its economy, 
What can that country do but fight back? They underestimated Russia. They underestimated President Putin. They underestimated, above all, the Russian national unity that has now prevailed to the extent that the Pope is calling for Zelensky to hoist the white flag. I've never seen such a tidal wave of anti-Catholic guff in my life on social media as that that has followed His Holiness's call today. Maybe he could have put it better. Maybe he could have avoided the illusion of the white flag, but the essence of his message is surely clear and unanswerable. The longer this is stalled, the worse will be the outcome for the remaining rump Ukrainian state. Meanwhile, little Macron threatened Russia this week that an advance on Kiev or Odessa would bring French troops into the war. Well, I thought he was a historian, Macron, but he obviously has forgotten what happened the last time French forces poured into and across the Russian steppe. Napoleon beat his retreat from Moscow, a bedraggled and defeated figure. The idea that the French society, riven from head to foot, most of them, 75% of them, against their pretender, their Dauphin, little Macron, are going to fight Russia for Ukraine, for Odessa, was always a non-starter. And quickly, the French armed forces made it clear that no such thing would be happening. But the fact that these raving fantasists in the chanceries of Europe, in the presidencies, in the prime ministerships of Europe are still entertaining in the face of all the facts that they can intervene in this proxy war directly and not suffer a total defeat. I've only got one word to say to you, and that is Oppenheimer. Take it in. Hear what I'm saying. By definition, if Russia is facing an existential threat, it will use every weapon in its armory. And if there are no red lines for Macron, there will be no red lines for Moscow. It's obvious. Oppenheimer's going to win all the Oscars. Quite right. Great film. But nobody seems to have calculated that the nuclear weapons Russia would land on Paris are 1,000 times more powerful than that monstrosity you see on the screen behind me that was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. You want that? You want some, Mr. Macron? Well, the French people don't, and they need to rise up and tell their president so. The rest of the leaders in Europe Schultz, who's committed acts of self-harm against his own people, against his own economy. Macron and little Rishi Sunak, about whom more later, who couldn't fight his way out of a wet paper bag, who's never heard a gun fired in anger, unless on the grouse moors if they allow people like him to come hunting with them on the grouse moors. Somebody would ask him for a gin and tonic. Trust me on that. Little Rishi Sunak, little Grant Shapps or Grant Green or whatever he's calling himself today amongst his multiple aliases. Britain is a country whose flagship aircraft carrier caught fire again this weekend that has a fleet of warships that crash into each other in the Solent, that can't join the war games for NATO, that can't send their commitment to the Red Sea because their ships ain't up to it. Britain's a country with an army that could fit into Villa Park, the home of Aston Villa, where they got humped by Tottenham Hotspur today. 
These fantasists, these gnats, these fleas threatening an elephant, of course, are only doing what Mussolini did. It was said of Mussolini that he went around the world threatening people with Germany's army. That's what little Grant Green is doing. It's what little Macron is doing. It's what little soldier Schultz is doing. They're threatening people with America's army. But the Americans don't want war either. That's the meaning of the virtually total collapse of the presidency of genocide Joe Biden, who, quite apart from all his other failings, which include, of course, his failings of actual cognition, of actually knowing where he is, what year it is, what flavor of ice cream he is eating, where the toilet is, and why you should go to it when you need rather than after you've done it in your pants. This man is the leader to whom Macron, Schultz, Sunak are bowing and scraping when he's not fit to be sent out for a loaf from the even tide home that he should be spending these last years in the twilight of his life in. And the American people ain't wearing it. Joe Biden's ratings have fallen to the low ever recorded by any president in office seeking re-election in all history. And his opponent is half mad himself, Donald Trump. I mean, it's not as if he's facing some insurgent Bill Clinton or Jack Kennedy. He's facing Donald Trump and he's facing the mother of all humiliating defeats. Unless, of course, they arrest Donald Trump before he gets to the starting gate. Unless, God forbid, they kill Donald Trump before he gets to the starting gate. The Democrats made a very big mistake in not moving Joe Biden out and bringing some kind of substitute other than Kamala laughing gas Harris in his place. Finally, I spent Saturday afternoon in what for me is a kind of heaven. I have been an honorary member of the National Union of Mine Workers since 1982. That's a long time ago. Two years after I became a member of the union, the epic, historic struggle between the miners and the Thatcher government began in 1984, exactly 40 years ago this month. I went to Doncaster. I went to the Hatfield Main Colliery. I went to the miners' club there. I joined the march with brass bands and bagpipe bands led by a Scotsman from Fife who left 61 years ago and still sounds exactly like a Fifer. Many Scottish miners moved to the Yorkshire coalfield when their own pits closed for economic reasons in the 1960s. When I got in, into the club, just ahead of the leader, Arthur Scargill, there was prolonged and entirely spontaneous cheering and applause. Not because I fought every day of that strike. Many of the people there are soldiers and, uh, of that uh, dispute, of course, but most of them are daughters and sons of the miners that fought that dispute. They weren't cheering me because of my role in the miners' union my support for their struggle from the first day until the last day and until now, they were cheering me because I had soundly thrashed the so-called Labour Party and the Conservative Party in the by-election here in Rochdale. They were cheering because they live in complete despair of Britain's political class. I'll be making my maiden speech on Tuesday. I'll be drawing on some of the things 
that Arthur Scargill said in his speech on Saturday about how our country has been systematically destroyed by our own ruling political and economic class, how our country has been de-industrialized, dis-industrialized, just like Germany is undergoing now. Before we entered that strike in 1982, we had a coal industry, a thousand years of coal underneath our feet. We had a steel industry, we had a car industry, a truck industry, a railway workshops industry, a motorbike industry. Our hammers flew, the sparks showered. We were a power still in the world and it has all been destroyed in the interests of globalized capitalism, in the interests of finance capital. Everything that happens in this country happens for the people with money, happens for the city of London. I'll be giving my speech on Tuesday in the budget debate. Look out for it. I'll be naming names. I'll be seeking to shame the guilty men and some women who are responsible for Britain's plight. I spoke to a man at my son's football today my son won man of the match, incidentally. I spoke to a man sitting on the bench watching the kids playing football today. He said to me, tell them something. Tell them that we once had a country. Tell them that we once had a community. We once had a society. We once had things that were great. And now the country is a shithole and the political class are responsible for it. It's going to be the mother of all talk shows. On YouTube, Keith Mitchell says, your success in Rochdale has made many, many more than just those who voted for you. As Roger Waters' mum says, do the right thing, George. Keep right with those in Rochdale and they will stand by you at the general election. I want to thank the great Roger Waters for his fulsome support in the contest. I want to thank Low Key, our own considerable genius, for coming to Rochdale and performing so brilliantly, so dazzlingly in the constituency. I want you all to write this down. I was listening today to Low Key's track, Long Live Palestine. And I always knew that it was musically extremely beautiful and inspiring. You know, the one with the chorus, free, free Palestine. But today, for some reason, in a car, I played it and I listened very carefully to the lyrics, which proved to me again that Loki isn't just a recording artist, isn't just an indefatigable activist. He is a professorial political genius. So write it down, Long Live Palestine. Watch it on Spotify at the end of this show by Loki, L-O-W-K-E-Y. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. And it's live from Rochdale. Get used to it. We've got a poll running in which already 44,264 people have voted. It's a simple question. Should Israel be banned from the Eurovision Song Contest? Yes or no? No. Let's make that 50,000 by the end of the show, shall we? Now, Rania Kalex, one of my favorite journalists and broadcasters, she's the host of Dispatches on Breakthrough News. And we're very lucky that tonight she's on the mother of all talk shows. Rania, uh, welcome back to the show. It's been some time. Wonderful to see you again. Um, what did you think of Joe Biden's idea? to build a pier 
in Gaza. Is he up to something or is this just a piece of madness? Uh, it's absolutely a piece of madness, George. But before I say what I think about that, I want to congratulate you on your win. Uh, I think it's not just a win Thank for you. you, George, but I think it's a win for Palestine in so many ways. And about the pier, this is theatrics. It's theatrics because there is a famine taking place in Gaza. Children are dying of starvation. Uh, we see the images. They're horrifying. Uh, they're reminiscent of images we recall from World War II during the Nazi Holocaust. Um, and this is intentional. It's an intentional policy by the Israelis of starvation. They're not hiding it. They are openly celebrating it, uh, both Israeli officials since this genocide began, as well as Israeli citizens who are standing at the border, callously protesting the entrance of any aid because they are openly desiring the starvation of children in Gaza. And this is happening because the U.S. government is allowing it to. And this pier that Biden has announced that he wants to build, which is going to uh, cost a lot of money, which requires sending something like thousands of U.S. troops uh, to go to the coast of Gaza. One, it's going to take 30 days to set up. I mean, how many Palestinians are going to die of starvation in those 30 days? Uh, and on top of that, it is potentially uh, placing some sort of military presence at the coast of Gaza, which hasn't really been discussed so much. But again, it's pure theatrics. All this requires to stop is a call from Joe Biden. He has for five months now entering the six months refused to stop this genocide because he wholeheartedly agrees with it and he wants it to continue. And I have nothing, I have no other, you know, there's nothing else to, to believe about Joe Biden's intentions besides that until he puts a stop to it. So this peer means nothing at all. Now, he did say that there would be a ceasefire. Um, laughing Gas Harris said it would be a six-week ceasefire before they began killing again uh, for Ramadan. But Ramadan uh, just began. Uh, there's no ceasefire. What's going on? What's going on here is that they don't care for a ceasefire because they want a ceasefire on Israel's terms. They want complete surrender. They want all the hostages uh, to be set back without any conditions. And they're not going to get that, especially after everything they've done in Gaza. So at the end of the day, all this talk of a ceasefire is, again, theatrics because the U.S. is refusing to place any pressure on the Israelis. And they don't even really want a ceasefire. They want to pause. That's it. They want to pause. So let's stop the genocide for a few weeks and then continue with it. This policy is so atrocious. And at this point, I mean, we can sit here and talk about the Israelis and their intentions. They have genocidal intentions. They're openly declaring it. They're openly celebrating it in very disturbing ways. But at the end of the day, again, this wouldn't be possible without the wholehearted, enthusiastic support of the Biden administration. They are, I mean, they've secretly approved 100 weapon sales to Israel that we just learned about, on top of all the open weapon sales that we know have been taking place, on top of the fact that they just keep sending any weapon Israel wants. They're, they have all this leverage, and they're unwilling to use it. So the question becomes, why? It's because they have a stake in this, George. They have a stake in this, because at the end of the day, when we think about October 7th, and what took place that day, you had, as Joseph Burrell of the European Union would call it, you had the jungle people firing back at the garden. And that is completely unacceptable to the rulers of empire. And so this genocide is intended as a kind of punishment, as a sort of display of violence, uh, as to set a precedent for the rest of the global South, that if you dare to fire back at your plantation owners, at your imperial masters, this is what we will do to you. And that's exactly what's happening right now. And until they feel they've sufficiently punished the population of Gaza, they're not gonna stop. Now, you mentioned genocide. I distinctly remember the International Court of Justice, the highest court in the whole world, uh, with the fanfare, at least in those countries that didn't suppress the news, like my own uh, in Britain, they didn't even televise uh, the findings of the ICJ. They plausibly, or rather, let me put it this way, they found Israel to plausibly be guilty of genocide and sent them for trial on that charge. And they gave them four weeks to 
uh, respond to uh, peremptory demands, which would have brought the slaughter in Gaza to a halt. Well, the slaughter did not halt, indeed it intensified, and I've heard nothing since from the International Court of Justice. Is this an example of the rules-based order they keep telling us about? You know, it's so interesting, George. They've spent all these decades creating this, you know, U.S.-led rules-based order that they've really just, you know, weaponized against any country that dares to, you know, stand up and really pave a path in, in their own interests rather than U.S. interests. But they're willing to completely destroy it in the name of protecting Israel, in the name of protecting the sort of a uh, spear of imperialism for the West in the Middle East. And they and they, and they really just they, they've created a mockery of international humanitarian law and they've really killed any pretense of the you know sort of freedom and democracy they claim to represent. Um, and they've essentially killed these international institutions that they've created. You know, they've also killed the UN in so many ways. Look at how helpless all of these international institutions have proven themselves to be in the face of genocide, if ever there was a reason for some sort of humanitarian intervention to prevent a bunch of genocidal sociopaths from carrying out their plans, it's now. And every legal measure, as important as those measures are to try to utilize, has proven to be a failure uh, in the short term, at least. And I think what that demonstrates is, yes, the end of the rules-based order, but also I think the importance of resistance in the region, George, because that is all that Palestinians have right now. All they have, all that's standing between them and complete and utter annihilation is the various armed resistance movements across the, the countries in the region, from Yemen to Lebanon to the groups that are fighting for their own survival in Gaza. Well, the uh, fighting is going to continue. And by the way, if a thousand American soldiers end up in Gaza, it will not be a comfortable billet for them, I am certain about that. So their mothers and sweethearts uh, should know that a thousand U.S. soldiers are being sent into, into real uh, danger and, and jeopardy if that happens. We'll see if it does happen. Uh, but I've got a question more difficult. Uh, it's difficult for me to ask. It's difficult for you to answer. Um, why has nobody else decided that force majeure was required. We've had China declare over and over again that it is completely unacceptable. We've had Russia declare the same thing. We've had South Africa. We've had the Global South uh, declare it. We've had Indonesia, which has had a hospital ship off the coast of Gaza now for five months, but unable to land and bring aid to the people. Why don't countries like China, if I was running China, I would say I'm sending in ships full of aid and you, Mr. Netanyahu, can decide whether or not you're going to fire on me for doing that. Why has that not happened? You know, George, I mean, I, I can't. I can't tell you what the Chinese are saying or what the Indonesians are saying or, or what the South Africans might be saying behind closed doors or really any country, but I would imagine that what we're seeing right now is a fear of the U.S. and Israel. I mean, the biggest armies in the world are the U.S., the European armies, and then Israel's a very powerful army, and they have nuclear weapons, and it is a mad dog, you know? The Israeli leadership used to like to say we have to behave like a mad dog so the world is scared to mess with us. But I think they've actually reached the level where they are the mad dog and it's frightening. It's we don't know what they're capable of doing. We just we we see we see some of what they're capable of doing in Gaza. They are behaving completely irrationally and outrageously violently. And their parent, the US, is complicit in that mad dog behavior. And I think it demonstrates that. As far as force goes, as far as power goes in terms of military power, the U.S. is still the hegemon in the world. And we see how far the U.S. is willing to go, not just when it comes to Israel. I mean, look at Ukraine. Look at how many weapons the U.S. has been willing to pour into Ukraine, with risking a potential nuclear war, uh, the use of nuclear weapons uh, with Russia 
over trying to maintain control over Ukraine and keep Russia out of the European sphere. So I think that this is a fear that countries are acting out of fear of the U.S. and Israel, and they can't guarantee, even the Chinese cannot guarantee that if they send a ship to the coast uh, of Gaza to try and force Aden, that the Israelis won't fire on them. And I think that speaks to the rogue nature of both Israel and the United States at this point in history, and it is terrifying. These countries are terrifying. People around the world should be scared of these countries. They, they are completely illegitimate at this point. And I think it demonstrates the need for U.S. empire to end because this violence is the fallout of that empire. And I think uh, in like a kind of microcosm way, the fact that Israel is really willing to take so much down with it. I mean, it's either we get to stay a settler colony or we will take everyone down with us. That's kind of the mentality they have. I think the U.S. has that mentality, but about the entire world. And it's frightening. It's a big question. I don't know the answer to how to deal with that, but it does point to a very dark future in many ways. Now, what did you think of the Pope's uh, call today on Zelensky to uh, to raise the white flag and sue for peace? It's got him on the Ukrainian death list, along with me and many others, maybe even including you. Uh, what What did you make of what he said? I'm sorry to smile. It's not a funny matter. It's just so outrageous. I don't know what else to do besides laugh a little bit. I mean, it's a bit late. We're two years into this war uh, and it should have ended a long, long time ago. But I think it speaks to the fanaticism on the side of the Ukrainians. I'm not sitting here saying Russia's perfect or so like angelic, but we know that on the Ukrainian side, the U.S. has been and its European partners have been arming and funding and encouraging uh, far right movements that are quite scary, quite nationalistic, and in some cases, neo-Nazi. Uh, so it's not surprising at all that you would see anybody who supports an end to this war be put on some weird fascistic kill list uh, by these people. It's very dangerous. And I think it just speaks to the kinds of forces that the so-called collective West represents around the world, whether we're talking about Ukraine, whether we're talking about the kinds of forces that they support against China, and whether we're talking about the very genocidal, fascistic, sociopathic society that is the country of Israel. Um, these are the allies of the West, and they always have been around the world. And I think we're kind of reaching a peak here where it's just so cartoonish. Like, how much cartoonish does it get, George, than seeing the Pope be put on a Ukrainian kill list for calling for the end of a war. And it's kind of, you know, there's a sort of parallel to what you see the Israelis do. The Israelis, anybody who calls for a ceasefire is an anti-Semite. Anybody who's anti-genocide is now an anti-Semite. I mean, it's just so ridiculous and so outlandish and the jokes kind of make themselves. Yeah, how will all this play in November, Rania, in your view? Uh, Joe Biden is sowing death and destruction around the world, making the United States, the most hated country in the world, alongside its mad dog, Israel. Um, he's failed economically. He's failed to heal the wounds of America. Uh, can he seriously be reelected at the age of 91 or whatever he is? I mean, let's be realistic also. Joe Biden is clearly suffering from some sort of cognitive decline. Uh, it's It looks like elder abuse, honestly, when you see the videos of him coming out, though I don't feel bad for him because he's overseeing a genocide. Uh, all that said, you know, aside from the personality of Joe Biden, I think what this demonstrates is that we have a just we have a two party dictatorship in the U.S. And it's very clear for everyone to see right now the sort of vote blue no matter who. Uh, Democrats who want to force us to force us to vote Democrat. Otherwise, we'll have the horrible, horrible Republicans and the horrible, horrible Trump. I mean, I don't really know how to respond to them other than what's worse than genocide. You know, I'm not telling people to vote for Trump, but really, what's worse than genocide? Genocide is the worst case scenario to me. And Joe Biden has proven that Democrats are actually are not a lesser evil. They are a part of the same disgusting, imperialist, parasitic system that creates genocides like what we're seeing in Gaza. What comes November? I think that we're going to see Joe Biden lose. 
um, if this continues. And even if it doesn't continue, I think at this point, people are so traumatized from seeing the you know dead babies on their social media feeds. And they blame Joe Biden for that, that even if there's a ceasefire tomorrow, there's a very good chance he'll lose because of the fact that Arab and Muslim voters matter and people who don't like genocide matter. And they're not going to vote for him. They've demonstrated they're angry at him with these Democratic primaries, where in one state after another, from Michigan to Minnesota and onward, you've seen a significant number of people voting uncommitted to protest Joe Biden and in swing states like Michigan, where he needs those votes. But he doesn't seem to care. Joe Biden, interestingly enough, is placing his support for Israel's genocide in Gaza over his own ability to secure a second term. And when that happens, they're going to blame Arabs. They're going to blame Muslims and they're going to blame the left and probably Putin and Xi Jinping like they always do. But we will know that these parties are not different. And this, if ever we've seen a moment in history when it is time to build something outside of this corrupt dictatorial two-party system that puts a gun to our heads every four years and forces us to vote for different flavors of genocide. If ever there was a moment to prove we need to build something else, it is now and I am seeing so much organizing happening on the ground in the U.S. to do just that. And that is what I'm encouraged and inspired by. A very set of circumstances present here in this country, which resulted in my election in Rochdale last week. Rania Kalek, tell us finally, how do people see breakthrough news? I'm sure many will want to do so now. Well, thank you so much, George. People can follow Breakthrough News on YouTube uh, and on all your social media platforms at BT Newsroom. Uh, I love the programming we're able to do. We're able to give a platform to lots of amazing people, hopefully soon you, George. Um, and yes, please follow along. We're covering Gaza sure. and much of the rest of the world all the time. Lovely. Thank you. Wonderful to see you. I know that it's widely shared by the audience. I'm seeing it on my screen now. Thank you, Rania Kalek of Breakthrough News for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. Let me take a quick break, then I'll be right back. There is hope. The hope is in our numbers. We're already boycotting all kinds of products, and it's working. They're all reporting significant drops in profit. We need to boycott. We need to protest often in numbers and with imagination when we get the opportunity to vote out the parties that are supporting the genocide. We must take them. And if that opportunity isn't yet available in your area, you need to make it. You need to join with people intelligently, shrewdly, in a way that will punish the incumbent genocide enabler. You can link up your church with another church, your trade union with another trade union, your community organization, your nursery, whatever, with another in Palestine. You need to reach out to them so that they know that people in Canada and in Britain and everywhere in the world are thinking about them because that is important for their morale. We're entitled to feel a kind of gut-wrenching sadness at what is going. We're entitled for our hearts to be broken, but we're not entitled to allow our spirits to be broken because the people there are depending on our spirits. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. I've just been told we've got a lovely little clip from my uh, sojourn to the miners commemoration coming up. Stay tuned for that. Now, the podcast is doing well, remarkably well. Uh, you can download the mother of all talk shows podcast to listen anywhere you like, in the car, in the kitchen, at the gym, and so on. Just scan the QR code on your screen. Now, last week's podcast was number two in Ghana, number six in Malaysia, 
number three in the United Arab Emirates, and again, number one in the Cayman Islands. The Cayman Islands? Seriously? We are, second week in a row, number one podcast in the Cayman Islands. Let's take some uh, calls. First of all, Mary Rose is in New Hampshire and is most welcome. Mary Rose. Hi, George. So can you hear me okay? Hi. I can. You can hear me. Okay, great. I am so honored to be speaking to you right now. I am having such a happy dance, and that's hard for me because I'm disabled and mostly bedridden. But I will tell you, I still take actions. Um, nonviolent actions on behalf of Julian Assange and on behalf of the Palestinians, Palestinians and Gazans. And I am so excited that you've been elected as a MP um, and your Scottish heritage, which I also enjoy. Um, and I'm already... I've already been on social media where people have been being so excited uh, on various platforms about your election and saying, you know, all the good things about you, that you're pro-Palestinian, and it's like, you know, yep. And someone said, yeah, he's also pro-Assange. And someone said, yeah, I hope that's for real. And I said, oh, trust me, he's about as pro-Assange as you can get. And... That's for sure. Yes. So, uh, well, God bless you, Mary Rose, for that lovely call and for your, your continued activism. Uh, I'm hoping very much to visit my good friend Julian in the dungeon at Belmarsh. I've just asked uh, for permission from the family uh, and uh, the campaign uh, to apply to the governor in Belmarsh because. The last time I saw Julian, we were being secretly filmed by the CIA, uh, even on my trip to the toilet, which I distinctly recall. Turns out that uh, uh, Adelson, the uh, CIA cutout, got a video of that within a week of that visit to the toilet, but more important, my discussions with my good friend Julian Assange. I do want to see him. I miss him terribly. In fact, whether they know it or not, the whole world misses him terribly. Because if Julian were free right now, if WikiLeaks with Julian at the head of it was free right now, just how different would be the media landscape as compared to the desert that it is today? Mary Rose, thank you. Staying in the United States, going to Florida, where Jay wants to talk about Gaza. Go ahead, Jay. Good evening, Mr. Galloway, and thank you for giving me a voice which my own country would never allow. And again, congratulations. Welcome, on Jay. Your Go ahead. Victory. Thank you. So uh, I would start out saying Thank you. That Here's the many more of them all over the country, all over our countries. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So I would say that my... What I have to say is, uh, well, the device has yet to be invented that could measure my anger and feelings of hopelessness as I watch this horror upon horror stacked upon a pack of lies fed to us about this Gaza, uh, what's going on in Gaza today. So I would offer an open apology to the people of Gaza and of all the Palestinians, wherever they're scattered throughout the world, I don't expect to be forgiven, and as well I shouldn't, or any of us, and that's where we're allowed to stand up and speak freely. We shall definitely never forgive the leaders of this country. With that being said, I would wish everybody God bless, inshallah, amen. Beautiful call, Jay, and don't uh, blame yourself uh, if we can speak against wrong, against injustice, we must speak against it. If we can 
raise our hand against injustice, we must raise our hand. And if we can do neither, we must curse it in our heart. You have just spoken on an international platform uh, on behalf of the good people in Florida, the good people in the United States. So you're entitled to be angry. It's right that you're angry. But please don't feel hopeless because every little thing that every person does will all add to the deluge of support for Palestine that is now present in the world. The deluge of opprobrium against the apartheid state of Israel, the genocide state of Israel. Every little thing that we do, even if it's only sending a tweet, even if it's only refusing to go into Starbucks or McDonald's, even if it is only writing a letter to our parliamentary congressional representatives, even if it's only sending a dollar to the right place. Every little thing that everyone does is a contribution to the whole. And God bless you for being a part of it. Comments on the YouTube chat tonight. Megan RP says, George, I finally just watched with lyrics, Loki's Free Palestine video made me cry. Everyone needs to hear it. Made me cry also, and I'd heard it a hundred times before, but the video was really something with it. That's uh, low key, L O W K E Y, low key, and it's uh, Long Live Palestine. It is a work of great art, but it's also a work of great political precision. Uh, Guni 1972 says Macron says yes to a NATO invasion. Schultz says no. Poland says yes. Sweden says no. It's just obfuscation for preparations. And we will, we will, says the BRICS nations have the solution. Cooperation, compassion, unity in diversity. The West should beg for forgiveness and join the party. Uh, on the line now from the great city of Liverpool is Terry on Little Rishi Sunak. Go ahead, tell. Hiya, George. Great to speak to you again. Uh, congratulations on your magnificent you, win in Rochdale. It was uh, it was fabulous to watch. Thank you. Um, also, Thank a, you. a terrific monologue tonight. Uh, you got so much in, uh, so much truth in twenty minutes that I, that I've ever heard. I think it was brilliant. Uh, but I wanted Thank to you, talk about Thank Rishi Sunak so uh, as a response to your win in yeah. Rochdale that he got that uh, let, yeah. let, let, let on out uh, in number 10. And then really what he was saying was he, he disagreed with the democratic process, that he didn't like it was really the, the yeah. gist of what he was saying. Yeah. Uh, and I think they must really fear you, George, uh, because they know that mm. people are now listening to you more and more and backing you. And um, I think I think it's... Uh, I think it was the, probably the best compliment they could have been paid was that the, the, was that they come out and yeah, stand down. Yeah, uh, it didn't street. feel like it right at that minute, but I think you're right, Terry. Uh, he got the lectern now. He built up a platform to disguise how small a man he is. He was so small that he was mightily relieved that the speaker uh, inexplicably actually uh, failed to notice me rising and rising and rising and rising throughout Prime Minister's questions on Wednesday, in which I would have given little Rishi a piece of my mind. Uh, but I'll have other opportunities. It was quite a surreal occasion. It is unprecedented, literally, for the Prime Minister to fly back at taxpayers' expense on an RAF plane. You'd think the RAF had better things to do than to fly little Rishi Sunak uh, to London to make a, a, a pantomime like that one. Uh, and there's not, I say surreal because it's not quite clear now what he intended to achieve by it. All he did was make it plain to uh, the British people, at least the discerning amongst them, uh, that he doesn't actually believe in democracy. You're only allowed democracy if you vote the way your rulers want you to vote. If you vote a different way, then 
your right to elect your MP will be undermined by the anathematizing of the person that you did vote for. Well, he's not in any position to anathematize me. I'm more popular in the country than Rishi Sunak. Of that, there is absolutely no doubt. I'm not saying I'm more popular than the Conservatives uh, or yet of Labour, but I'm definitely more popular than Rishi Sunak. If he had the courage, the ability to face me on camera in a one-to-one -one debate, there would only be one winner of that contest, which is why it will never happen. I've got to say, and I'm choosing my words carefully, Terry, for reasons you'll understand, it's just not British to attack the voters for how they voted. It's not a British value that we keep hearing about to try to invalidate a democratic election because you don't like the way that it came. Let me reiterate what happened. I got more votes for the Workers' Party of Britain than Labour, Conservative, Liberal Democrat, and reform put together, more than all four of them put together. And they didn't even come second. A man that was unknown outside of Rochdale came second, distant second, but not distant from third and fourth and fifth and sixth place. The reform candidate, I'll never forgive uh, Nigel Farage for this, Terry, I was, you know, a prominent figure in the Brexit campaign, in the campaign led by Nigel Farage. And he put up against me a guy who'd campaigned for Remain in the Brexit referendum, a reprobate who insisted it was a two-horse race between him and me. He managed to come sixth in a two-horse race. That's quite an achievement. I'll never forgive Farage and Tice for that because the vile campaign of the reform candidate in Rochdale is still being talked about outside in the street, outside this studio right now. Terry, thanks for that. You got my blood up. Monkey Boy says, remember, Sunak said on the evening of March the 1st, you can freely criticise the actions of this government or indeed any government that is a fundamental democratic right. Yeah, as long as you don't vote for it. On the line is the legend, Simon in Florida. A nation mourns, Simon. Victoria Newland is retiring. Tell us more. Well, Mr. Galloway, um, just in case you ever doubt that you and I are not in sync um, after your win by 40% in the Rochdale by-election. I may point out that this is my 40th call to you, so uh, the wheels of history do seem to have us firmly cogged together. You see but the if I may, in I'll this is uh, amazing. I'll, I'll, I'll save the um, news which your audience will find um, interesting and disgusting regarding Victoria Newland. But since you have mentioned it, I think it would be very, very informative, not only for your British audience, but anyone who has an interest in 20th century industrial relations, is to point out the similarities between the anti-genocide protests that happen on an almost weekly basis across many cities of the United Kingdom and the infamous battle of Orgreave between the National Union of Miners strikers mm. and police gathered from 18 different areas of Britain in contravention of all the previous norms and procedures that occurred on the 18th of June 1985. Now, not only were those miners utterly demonized by politicians and the media, but on that occasion, the police attacked unprovoked the unarmed and peaceful demonstrators repeatedly during the course of the day and then horrified at the prospects of national revulsion against the 
actions of the uniformed police who had turned up fully prepared to engage in battle, as was revealed in the subsequent public inquiry that he occurred 31 years later, the BBC yes. swapped out their film footage from the day to make it appear that the miners attacked the police and not the other way round. A mark of shame which will haunt them forever in history. So going on to Victoria Newland, oh. and I, I do hope people will look that up and they can they can easily find that in the Battle of All Grieve. Just look on Wikipedia. I appreciate you don't have time to discuss that any further. The day after it was announced that she would be leaving her post as um, acting deputy secretary of the uh, US State Department, where she had been wielding her malign influence for over three decades. It was announced that she would be receiving a full professorship at Columbia University, one of America's top, top universities. And not only that, but she would be the head of their International Visiting Fellows Program that would be teaching the subject of the transition from the rules-based international order into the new multipolar system, but according to the prospectus for the course, with a set of rules in the new order that has yet to be established. And I'm pretty sure that all those visiting scholars under her control will um, receive um, friendly visits from the CIA with their recruiting prospectuses as well. I'm absolutely certain of it. Simon in Florida, on your 40th call, let me heartily congratulate you on quite an innings and may you keep on scoring runs more and more over the next hundred shows. Uh, Pam McCoy says, I love Simon. I learned so much history from him. There you go, Simon. Grassy Knoll says, Victoria Newland was Rosemary's baby. Well said. Look, I'm going to take a break now. I'm a minute late in doing so, but coming up after this break is Tadig Hickey, an Irish comedian, actor, and writer of note who has been indefatigable in defense of the people of Gaza over this last five and a half months. Stay tuned for him. George, I'm just looking at another dimension in this uh, Gaza war conflict. Could this be a religious conflict in the guise of it's not Islam versus Christianity versus Judaism, but an ideology, a, a Zionist ideology in establishing their leader that is supposed to come in, in the future and they will then govern and rule? It's in their ideology, for sure. The Zionists are uh, no more and no less than a nationalist ideology. They are nothing whatsoever to do with religion. Anybody who thinks Netanyahu is religious hasn't looked too closely into his private life. These people are extreme nationalists, exceptionalists. Some Americans believe in American exceptionalism. Zionists believe in Jewish exceptionalism. Nobody, in truth, is exceptional. There's nothing religious about it. It's about land. It's about nationalist supremacy, ethno-religious supremacy on the land of Palestine. And the Europeans colonized Palestine in the same way that the Europeans colonized South Africa. So fitting, the victims of white European colonialism are coming to the aid of other victims of white European colonialism and they're doing the whole world a signal service. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway.
Now, an astounding 46,525 people have already voted in the poll, should Israel be banned from the Eurovision Song Contest? You can vote yes or no on my Telegram channel, t.me forward slash George Galloway, on my Twitter, uh, George Galloway Official, George Galloway MP Official, uh, the YouTube community poll, or on the YouTube stream. If you're watching on the YouTube stream, please, even at this hour, send a message to your followers and your contacts. If you want to call the show, if you're in the US or Canada, it's plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. It's toll free. If you're in the UK or Ireland, it's 08081 9655522. Again, free of charge. If you're elsewhere in the world, it's 442039662625. Now, Taig Hickey is not just an Irish comedian, actor, and writer. He's become a major player in the social media battles that have taken place over the last five and a half months. He is absolutely indefatigable. He is so courageous that the enemies of truth and justice have already begun to retreat under fire from him. I'm a huge admirer of his work. He even had a Palestinian flag on the stage just the other night. I saw a picture moments ago. Taig, welcome back to the mother of all talk shows. I asked you last time uh, if this was harming your career uh, in any way. Is it now seriously harming your career? And if it is, how does, what does that say about Ireland today? First of all, thanks for having me back and congratulations on your win. You're annoying all the right people. Um, Thank you. I, Thank I, you. I think, yeah, I mean, it's, it's affected my career a little bit, but to be realistic about it, we're quite lucky in Ireland. Ireland is an outlier in Europe. As you know, I've got friends in Germany, I have friends in Britain, and I have friends in the US whose careers are destroyed by their pro-Palestine stance. It's not that extreme here, but there's subtle and not so subtle things I've noticed, like a very small example is I used to pick up quite a lot of corporate work. I did, vo like voiceovers would have been one of my main sources of income for about the last five years. Since the outbreak of the so-called war uh, on October 7th, I haven't had an audition. I haven't had an email. I haven't booked a gig. None of the corporates uh, are reaching out to me anymore. So it feels to me like if you're anti-genocide, you're bad for business. That certainly seems to be the case. But I'm very lucky, George. I have built up a following from people around the world now. And it means it means a lot to me because you know the way in our part of the world, it, you're only a success if you've made it in Britain and the US. It's a completely Western colonial mentality. But I'm very proud to say that like most of my f fan base and followers now are in the Middle East. And I love that. Or, or the Arab diaspora in Canada and the US. So I, I'm very lucky on Patreon. I've got a lot of followers who are helping me out. So... You know, yeah, my career has been damaged a little bit, but I think we're at a point where personally I feel what's going on in Gaza right now is the situation is so grave. It's so extreme that if you're thinking about your career right now, I think you've kind of lost your moral com moral compass. And I try not to be judgmental about other people, but I don't think it's a time to be thinking about your career. It's gone beyond a social media thing for me now because I have Palestinian friends in Cork, in Ireland, in Dublin and beyond, beyond Ireland, I should say. And they're every day waking up, checking their phones to see if members of their family have died from starvation, if they've been assassinated. If I'm going to show them solidarity, both as a friend and as somebody with some sort of influence online, I think I need to be loud and proud about my support for their cause. And more importantly, the end to this unspeakable genocide that's being live streamed in real time that everybody knows about. So my career is not that important to me right now. Well, uh, very, very uh, well said, Taig, uh, and many people will be applauding you uh, literally as well as metaphorically right now. Uh, you've become uh, a bit of a hero. What drew you into this? Uh, did you pay a lot of attention to the issue uh, for long, or was it the extreme nature of this post-October 7 genocide that has moved you to 
make it such a major part of your life? I feel like, I mean, as I was, as we spoke about before, I'm very proudly an Irish Republican and Irish Republicanism for me, with my friends in the North and my friends in the South, it's always been an internationalist uh, thing. You know, we've shown support as Irish Republicans for Cuba, for South Africa. I think that's the beauty of Irish Republicanism. And I think it's why it kind of has sustained itself in terms of a global appeal and understanding, because unlike loyalism, it, it isn't insular. It is, it is internationalist. So I think I've always been aware um, of what's going on in Palestine. I've always felt strongly about it. I probably didn't have an opportunity to do that much about it with my own work until one of the last so-called wars on Gaza. I think it would have been 2021. I had started making sketch comedy on my own then and I did some sketches that did like a lot of numbers. So I suppose I would have would have entered into the, the social media war, as you say, in that period. But it was also a period where I where I reached out to people in the IADA camp and stuff and I built relationships with Palestinians, which is the most important thing. Because, you know, to go back to that point again, where it's not just a kind of a, an abstract concept when you become friendly with people who are actually going through a genocide. It's an extraordinary thing. It's it's as close as I can imagine to being witness to the so-called famine in our country or during the conflict in the North, where you would actually be with people, you're going through it in real time. Um, so when when that happened, I think in 2021, I, I suppose I was drawn in. I became very passionate about it. And then in the outbreak post October 7th, as I say, it's gone on to a level where I, I actually didn't think it was possible for it to get to this level of murder and mayhem and organise mass starvation. And for the West, not only to still be shrugging its shoulders and looking the other way, but to be aiding and abetting it and vocally supporting it. It's at a level where I feel like any reasonable person, Irish Republican or not, if you care about human beings, if you care about children, uh, if you care about women, if you care about journalists, if you care about frontline workers, that you would just have to stop everything you're doing and go to that mentally and spiritually, you know, that you would just, your, everything that you could do would, would be with the people of Palestine right now. I don't understand how it's any other way. And I, I actually would love to use the opportunity to just say to, to people who have influence, particularly on, on Instagram and, and whatnot, if they haven't said something before, it's never too late to join the cause. I know Palestinians will be very grateful for you to do it. Nobody will be, where Where have you been? I, I, I don't think so anyway, and I'm obviously not gonna speak for Palestinians, but we just need voices. We just need numbers. Like, please use your platform. It, it, you've got an opportunity to, to use your platform for the most extraordinary purpose you'll ever have the opportunity to do. Like, I urge people to do it. It's not too late. Well, I, I won't hold my breath for Bono to join us uh, on the international <laughs> uh, picket line, but it would be good if he did, even at this late uh, stage. En passant, I should tell you that I met in the corridors of power this week, uh, Lord Taylor, John D. Taylor, the former Unionist MP, now peer, mm. uh, who uh, I've traveled with in the Middle East uh, and who is as strong a supporter of the Palestinians in Gaza as Absolutely. you or me. So it isn't all uh, unionists. It isn't all, all uh, loyalists. 100%. And I, I was very grateful. He's an old man now, but he, he hobbled after me on his walking stick to congratulate me and to... Uh, to congratulate me not just on my election, but on the role I've been playing over the last five and a half months to defend uh, the poor people of Gaza. It's, it's only right mm -hmm. that I should say that. Now, you are an Irish Republican, as half an Irishman, so am I. Uh, how should we evaluate uh, the uh, Sinn Féin visit uh, to the White House? I'm, I'm in a bind about it. I, I don't support Sinn Féin. I used to, but I don't now since they became a bit too Blairite for me. Uh, but I support their aim, and I know they're the only people who are going to bring that aim uh, to fruition. So I don't want to attack them. I don't want to weaken them. But I find it very difficult to accept the argument that you should hand a shamrock to the blood-stained hand of Joe Biden. What do you stand on that? I don't want to echo your sentiments too closely uh, at the risk of just not having a very fruitful discussion or debate, but I feel very close to what you're saying. I mean, I would be 
you know, I wear my heart on my sleeve. I would be traditionally a Sinn Féin supporter, or at least an Irish Republican. I would vote for the party in Ireland that I feel would be most likely to fulfil the dream of a united Ireland, being completely honest. That's what got me interested in politics. That That's where I've come from. Um, I have many friends in Sinn Féin, but I kind of feel like if you... I'm not a member of the party. I probably should say that. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, just a lowly comedian. I'm just a joker in the pack with an interest in politics. But um, I would say that if you want something to be better, you should be open in your assessment of it. And I think in this particular instance, um, Sinn Féin are making the wrong moral decision, I feel. And I think if you were to just be mercenary about it for a moment, I think it's potentially the wrong tactical decision as well. I mean, I know you speak about Labour and the Tories being two cheeks of the same arse. I mean, we have the we have the original arse in Ireland, like the most long running arse in, in kind of European politics in, in terms of Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael literally carving up the state since its foundation and, and ruling it themselves in this kind of meandering morass of centre right, so-called centre left. Um, and we have an opportunity for Sinn Féin to lead the first leftist government in the South ever, which is something that I, I, I probably would have dreamed of um, since I was in, in school. But I think the stance on Palestine, which offers a lot of significant substance, I would say that, and like you, I'm very eager not to be too critical of a party that, that is offering people like me and much younger than me an opportunity to get Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael out of government. Because in terms of housing, in terms of health, they have proved themselves inept and completely out of touch with the needs of ordinary people in Ireland. So I would love to see a leftist government in Ireland. That would be a dream. But Sinn Féin's uh, young vote, I think, particularly is not it's it's actually quite tenuous in my opinion so i would traditionally vote for Sinn Féin because i'm an irish republican a lot of young people are voting for Sinn Féin in my opinion in my experience because they feel like they're going to deliver proper housing they're going to sort out health they're going to do the things that young people kind of care about i think most young people that i'm meeting at marches anyway are so appalled by what's going on in gaza and have arab and palestinian friends now in ireland the fact is that the Palestinians you speak to do not want Irish politicians from any party to go to the White House on Patrick's weekend. That is a fact. We don't expect any better from the government parties. I certainly wouldn't. They're always going to go on a jolly and you know, respect their own corporatist interests in doing so. I think Palestinians expected more of Sinn Féin and I still think it's not too late to do the right thing. I think that the party, I think, has said something like Palestinians will understand uh, that we have to put our priorities first when Irish unity is obviously the main my, main priority of Sinn Féin and going to Washington is traditionally a good thing to do to pursue Irish unity. I'm talking to Palestinians, Palestinian friends here and the fact is they don't understand. They don't understand. And to go back to what I said earlier about internationalism, Solidarity with substance means that when your ally, when somebody if similarly oppressed, colonized uh, group of people who you have the solidarity and kinship with for a long, long time are in the situation the Palestinians are in right now, I feel like solidarity with substance means that you put your own private goals and desires to the side and you actually offer genuine fellowship to the oppressed. And I, and I feel like it's going to be a moral and a tactical error. Tig, uh, you mentioned the corporate work has dried up. How can our audience support your work? How can they see you? Where do they find you? I'm on all the usual old nonsense, um, Facebook and uh, Instagram and Twitter and TikTok and all that. And I have a Patreon account. If people don't like Patreon, I, there's a PayPal as well. But what I would say is if you're finding it hard, because I think a lot of pro-Palestine people are being silenced right now. If you're finding it hard to share my stuff, I get a lot of messages from people saying, I can't share your stuff. You're being shadow banned or blocked or whatever. Just share another pro-Palestine account. Just keep sharing and prioritize Palestinians. Because if we keep supporting each other, we can kind of create a stand and break through the tech fascism that's going on as well at the moment. So let's just stick with each other and not get too bogged down and prioritizing one or two people. We're, we're a tribe. So thank you. And thanks, George, for your time. You're quite a man, Tyg. Thank you very much indeed for joining us again.
on the mother of all talk shows. Should Israel be banned from the Eurovision Song Contest? It's now almost 48,000 voters. 47, 953. Can you get this to 50 by the end of the show? You've got about another 20 minutes, 25 minutes. Let me take a break and then there's a short video of me with my colleagues, my fellow members of the National Union of Mine Workers. Stay tuned. There's a group of people in Twitter who are daily posting discussions about Gaza, Lebanon, what's happening, news updates, aid for Gaza, uh, and trying to enlist the help of Jordan and France and any other regional entity that will help get more aid into Gaza and all of Gaza, all of Palestine, for everyone who suffers. So I want to request that everyone who is listening to this go to your local council meetings and peacefully request that their representatives at the local levels do this because it works. Thanks for the call, Pia, in Uruguay. I'm a free man of the city of San Francisco, awarded to me for my work on Palestine, on the steps of City Hall itself. So it was a particular delight for me that the San Francisco Council voted by eight votes to three to demand a ceasefire. And that decision didn't come out of nowhere. It came out of campaigning to force the local authority representatives to vote. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Well, it's live from Rochdale and the votes are rolling in again in Rochdale. We're really putting Rochdale on the map, aren't we? Should Israel be banned from the Eurovision Song Contest? Get your votes in now. Let's make this a 50,000 vote poll. Let's take some calls. We've got another legend on the line. Erobos in New York on the 2024 US elections. Erobos, welcome back. Hello. Can you hear me, Mr. Galloway? Very clearly. Welcome. The whole show is waiting for your words. Hail, hail to the people of Rochdale. Hail, hail to the people of Palestine. Hail, hail to the people of Yemen. And hail, hail to the Honorable Right Member of Parliament, His Eminence, His Excellency, George Galloway, I can say I'm very when touched. Natalia, you, absolutely, I can say that when the tally of the tally said twelve thousand, I, I, I lost it. I lost my shot. I was clapping. I was laughing. <clears throat> Pardon me. I felt that I won. Right. I, I felt that I personally did, won. Bro. I felt you like did. it was a. It was a victory for me, for the working class, for the working poor, and the old-fashioned poor. And you know, I, I was I, my neighbor thought I won the lottery, right? I was making so much noise. I went I went nuts. I completely, completely lost it, you know. And and it shows that what what you were able to achieve with the people of Rothschild, people of Rothschild and the Workers Party, it reflects our failure our failure of courage in the U.S. Because we had the same, we had a similar opportunity, right, with the work with uh, the People's Party, you know, back in June of last year. And, you know, in Cornell West, and when, when he announced with us, you know, it was the most interest, according to Google, Google, Google Analytics ever shown in him, and all the rest of that. And in short, he allowed the people closest to him and you know he allowed um, you know his his friends and and all these different people to influence him to to leave the the People's Party, right? He allowed he allowed little um, 
identity politics thugs, right? These these YouTube uh, these YouTubers who use identity politics and culture wars as a weapon to bully him. You know, imagine that a man like him, 40, 50 years in activism, you know, PhDs, been all over the place, always screaming in the street about something or the other. He allowed little, you know, little little simpleton identity clowns on YouTube to bully him to leave us, right? And he's been a failure ever since, right? Because you can't demonize half the country who are also workers, Trump supporters, and expect to win an election. It's mathematically, it's incalculable, incalculable. It is impossible, right? And, and the, the cynicism and the cowardice of the people we have here, it angers me. However, on the upside, your, your win and your re-entry you know, in, into the into the into the uh, the parliamentary dungeon has inspired many people here as well, right? You built the house. If you build it, they will come. And people have and people came and people showed up. And we we're right at that time. We're right at that time. And you know, this is why I said a victory when you won. You know, I I still feel elated. The euphoria rush hasn't went down. I have a natural high just thinking about it. It's like the best news I've had in years, right? It's it's, it's better than winning the Powerball, wow. which is how uh, a poor person gets a billion dollars here these days. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I had to share. Ah, that. well, I, uh, Erobos, uh, stay clear of the devil's buttermilk. But uh, I, I'm deeply grateful to you. I'm moved by the very kind things that you said. Uh, the Cornell West story is a complex one that most viewers, uh, not in the United States, maybe even most in the United States, cannot quite fathom. And perhaps after the presidential election in November is the right time to return to it. And return to it, I promise you, uh, we shall. Because every country needs a workers' party. Every country needs a party whose... Um, whose uh, role is to stand up for uh, the people that make the wealth in the country, whose interests are entire and separate from the interests of others. That was the basis of the foundation of the Labour Party 120 years ago, uh, and it's the basis for the foundation of the Workers' Party, because just as the Liberals in the 19th century failed to represent properly the interests of working people and had to be superseded, superseded by a Labour Party. So now the Labour Party has utterly failed to represent the interests of the workers, their parents, their children, uh, that there is a need for a refoundation of a party of Labour, a party of the workers. Now, our uh, membership has more than tripled in the last five or six weeks. Uh, and we have a meeting uh, here in Rochdale next Sunday uh, of uh, everyone who's joined uh, in the Northwest, in the greater Manchester area. Uh, and uh, somebody asked me, uh, I've only got 400 chairs, said the man uh, from, the, uh, from the venue. Uh, will that be enough? I had to tell him, actually, I'm not sure if it will. Uh, it may be that there'll be standing room only in the Greater Manchester launch of the Workers' Party. I spent till almost midnight last night uh, negotiating with independent people, uh, Labour councillors that are about to defect, Labour councillors that have already defected and are now sitting as independents. I had a steady stream of people are looking for tickets to be our candidate in this constituency or that for council elections and for general election, parliamentary election. I mean, everything just got bigger. Uh, you know, in America, everything's bigger. But the Workers' Party definitely got much bigger. And its name is everywhere. People are joining it at a very, I was going to say a steady rate. It's far more than a steady rate. Our people... I can't keep up with it. Their children are enlisted to send out the membership cards uh, to the uh, people who are joining it. There are many lessons 
Uh, you've got to run elections professionally. Uh, you've got to pick the right leader. You've got to pick the right candidate. I think the People's Party of America did not. Uh, and you've got to uh, know how to communicate with ordinary people uh, who are not the YouTubers, who are not the, uh, the identity political clowns. I, I told you about the venue yesterday of the miners. Every one of them working class, 99% of them white English people, daughters and sons, and some surviving fighters from the uh, great strike in 84, 85, including the leader and the ultimate working class hero, Arthur Scargill, a young 86. He spoke for an hour at the podium brilliantly, never lost his place once. He's five years older than your president, Joe Biden. Uh, God bless Arthur Scargill. But here's my point. Class consciousness and understanding that the one identity that unites 90%, maybe 99% of all the people is that they depend on their work to live. They depend on their wages or their salary to live, workers, by hand or by brain. These people in the auditorium yesterday in Doncaster had a class consciousness which completely transcended any other level of identity that they experience. And we all have multiple identities. Some of us are straight, some of us are gay, some of us are black, some of us are white. Some of them like Celtic, some of them like Rangers, some of them like United, some of them like City. Some of them think American football is an excrescence, or as somebody in my office an hour ago said, I love American football. You see my point? We've all got different identities. So why not concentrate on the one identity that unites all of us? That is our relationship to power and wealth as workers. Workers by hand or by brain. White collar workers as well as blue collar workers. Including retired workers. Including the children of workers who haven't yet entered the labor force. If we could unite all of those aerobos, no power on earth could stop us. None. They declare it a victory without a punch being thrown if we could unite the mass of the people. Staffordshire is where George is. He wants to talk about the UK political class. George, welcome. Welcome. To yourself. Hello, George. Thank you. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, I just would like to say that uh, you've destabilized the debate, and I congratulate you. It's an amazing Thank feat, you. based on the fact that uh, obviously um, we weren't, we hadn't, ha we haven't had anything like that um, politically, or somebody to stand up and make a change like that ever. Really, so well done for that. Thank you. I've lost George. I don't know if the rest of you have. Let's try and get back to him. And meanwhile, let's talk with Dino in Cambridge on Palestine. Go ahead, Dino. Hi, George. First of all, can I congratulate Hi. you for a resounding victory in Rochdale? Thank you so much. Did you catch that? I don't know what's happening here, but I'm losing all the colors. Let's throw to the miners video. It's only a few minutes long, but you'll love to see it. Here is me and Gayatri amongst the mining community in Britain. I'm an honorary member of the National Union of Mine Workers, South Wales area, Mardi Lodge, ever since 1982 and I fought every day of the minor strike because I knew and unfortunately some of our labor leaders 
did not know, did not understand that the miners had to win if the working class movement in Britain was to survive. If the miners had won, how different the history of our country would have been. That's why Thatcher strove might and main to destroy the miners' union, because they were everything that she hated. They proved that there is such a thing as society, not just individuals, but society, community, union. The very meaning of the word union was exemplified by the National Union of Mine Workers, the families of the miners, the communities in which they lived, and the friends who came to their side. It was, of course, to end in broken hearts, in a broken industry, in a broken economy, in a broken Britain. But we revere the memory of the struggle of the mine workers 40 years on. You know, John Lennon said a working class hero is something to be. Arthur Scargill is the ultimate working class hero. In fact, all the miners were working class heroes. All their wives, all their children, all the members of their community. So it's with a mixture of sadness and pride that I join this commemoration today of the 40th anniversary of the great historic epic struggle of the British mine workers. Well, I thought it was longer than that. I don't know what happened to the rest of the footage, but we'll maybe try and show you that on Wednesday. Uh, Wild Woodlands Southwest says the pier is a Trojan horse, a beachhead from the ocean. And Queen N. Jinga Lives says, Gigi, I'd appreciate some coverage on Haiti. The US has Marines on the ground and are planning another occupation. Thank you for that. We'll look at that. We covered Haiti quite extensively in the past. Malin A says regarding the apartheid state and fear and the best army in the world, we see pardon me, that this is not true. They are only genocidal but in no way powerful. Let's try and go back to Dinos in Cambridge. Have another go there. Go ahead, Dinos. No, that hasn't worked uh, either. So here's the voting so far. Should Israel be banned from the Eurovision Song Contest? Yes, 96% on Telegram. 88% on Twitter, where a push was made by the opposition. 86% on the YouTube community poll and 92% on the YouTube stream. Not many takers for Israel in the Eurovision Song Contest. Still got about five minutes to vote if you want to help me get that poll over 50,000. Vijaya Surya Mutri says the small countries have no voice at the UN. The recommendations are never implemented. And Sid Hadfield says the signs have been there for 80 years, but the liberals, Western liberals, failed to do anything about it. They played dumb, while warning sign after warning sign unfolded before them. And King John says Palestinians are not stupid. They have heard of the Trojan horse. Well, look, the phone lines are red hot and they are melting, uh, but we seem to be having difficulty hearing callers. So we're trying to sort that out now. DW says GG's viewing numbers have doubled since his Rochdale win. Uh, last In the last week, Three million people watched the mother of all talk shows. Three million. And it's still rising. Uh, I think his party, the Workers' Party of Britain, has tripled in size in the same time. It's kicking off. Lol. It is DW kicking off. And we have, indeed, even more than trebled in size. Cha-cha-cha-ha-ha-ha-999. Poll suggestion. Will King Charles or any royals Find the courage to give the crown to GG or to at least speak up against the barbaric genocide in Palestine and the US-UK-NATO proxy war on Russia. 
Well, thank you. I decline the office of king. There's only one king uh, for me, and his name is Jesus Christ, and he will come back one day. Until then, there should be nothing called a king. And I talked, uh, I think, in the last show about the monstrosity that in order to take my seat in the House of Commons, I have to pledge allegiance to King Charles and all his heirs and successors, whomsoever they may be. Let's hope there's not a terrible accident and Prince Andrew ends up as the heir and successor. Lee Ming Lum says President Herzog is a guest of Amsterdam right now for a Holocaust memorial, a protest happening in front of an event. Amsterdam is in the same country as The Hague. Well said. Matt is in Portland in the United States on Joe Biden. Let's hear from him. Go ahead, Matt. Hey, hey George, I want to apologize for last week. I didn't mean to swear on your show. I didn't say that first. That's okay, my friend. Yeah, I, I noticed okay. something. Go ahead. Um, yeah, when Joe Biden had his scream fed at the state of the boar, I called the state because it was boring. It was like him screeching at it. People get off my lawn. A lot of people are not talking about what Donald Trump said in his acceptance speech on Tuesday. He made it very clear if he gets back in the White House, we America stands with Israel and he'll go to war with the Arab world. And I'm like, what? How is he, how is he going to do this? Start the draft again? Good luck. I'm like, these people are, they're, there's just something wrong with them. They're all psychopaths. They're all genocidal. It's like, you know, look at people in, in South Korea right now are protesting their own government because they want America out. They've been saying for years, get, get the, close these military bases, get America out of our country. We're tired of them. And yet America put in uh, this lawyer who's now arresting protesters. And look what happened in South Dakota. Christy Nome has now made it illegal to criticize Israel. It's like... The, the, Incredible. The, it's like you, Look, Matt, oh. uh, it's, quite clear that it's, it's quite clear that the election is between Genocide Joe and Zion Don. Uh, both of their statements and actions uh, are and have been utterly deplorable. I'm going to hazard a guess that while we know Biden means it, it might be that Zion Don doesn't mean it. Uh, of course he might, but I have a feeling that he doesn't. Zion Don only recognizes one power, and that's himself. If he's the president of the United States, I don't think that Netanyahu will be ignoring him and disrespecting the United States in the way that they are under Joe Biden. I might be wrong on that. I don't support either of them. My candidate is Dr. Jill Stein, the candidate of the Green Party, a very good friend of mine, a very fine person. But I'd rather that Trump won than Biden. I wouldn't be happy that Trump won, but I'd be very happy that Biden didn't win, just for the sake of the possibility that Trump in office will be different to the kind of things he's been saying over the last five and a half months on this particular subject. Matt, over to you. What's your response to that? Oh, it's, I, I agree that in one way, Trump, Benjamin Nahu would definitely listen to Trump. If Trump said, hey, stop it, Benjamin Nahu would, because they are friends. And um, remember, he gave him Golan Heights. He recognized Jerusalem illegally as the, as the capital of, of Israel, and he's been more supportive than Joe Biden has. Joe Biden isn't running, Blinken's really running things, and he's got a citizen, he's a citizen of both Israel and America, which I think is ridiculous. As Scott Ritter says, if you're a citizen of Israel, you should not be allowed to be in our government. And um, I agree with that. And Blinken, he's just weak. Look, he lets Benjamin Nahu knock him around, and then when he goes talk to the Arab leaders, they kind of go, we don't respect you. And so how is he, how is he going to get anything done? The reason I'll say this, China's not getting involved, listen to what America's saying. We're going to go to war with China. So they have to, they can't physically get involved because they got to be prepared. They're taking this stuff serious. China is, but at the same time, they're keeping their military at home because they're worried 
that this war with with America is going to happen, so they have to be prepared, and they know Russia will have their back because most of the military isn't even fighting Ukraine, and they've been doing exercises with both North Korea and Russia. So, and plus, they moved all their they moved a lot of their missiles facing at facing aimed at military bases in Philippines, Guam, and Japan. And they're they're not they're not yeah. and um, yeah. So it's like. Japan can't, can't go to war. They don't have the population. The population's aging. They're not having kids anymore. It's really sad what's happened There's to Japan. There's more dogs than and, children. There's more oh, dogs no. than children in Japan. Just think about that. Matt, thanks for the call. Ben Vada, Veda says, letting America in your country is like the Roach Motel. They check in, but they never check out. Uh, on the line from Cardiff in Wales, is Akil. Go ahead, Akil. Oh, salam, brother uh, George. This is Akil Kata, originally from Iraq. Um, I've been in Cardiff 41 years. And I would like to point out, uh, first of all, we would, we would like to congratulate ourselves as Iraqis and Welsh people uh, for your win um, uh, on behalf of thousands and thousands of people, uh, 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 Iraqis uh, in United Kingdom. Uh, I would like to say that we will welcome you in Wales, actually, to come and uh, have a, a big meeting with uh, all the communities. And I've been in touch with many, many, many in the last uh, 10 days since your win, and it's all positive. All they're waiting for is really in the next general election, we will have a big turnout against um, uh, Keir Starmer and Rushi Sunak, who they actually, unfortunately, they are not representing the majority of British people. No. Now, um, w one thing I would like to add is um, I've just ordered uh, the biggest you can say a uh, Palestinian flag and we put it on the side wall of our house uh, just to show that we are human first um, uh, and we are not against anybody but we are just for humanity and we love your work and hopefully um, uh, uh, we will be able to work together and uh, uh, by the way we've joined uh, Workers Party last week. Thank you. Oh, how wonderful. Wow, what a final sign-off. Thank you, Akil, in Cardiff, and all uh, your fellow Iraqis. I never forgot Iraq. If I hear the word Iraq, I still turn around as if somebody called my name. I still dream of your country, and I'm very happy to hear that you have joined the party. Now, I get to join my wife, who's elsewhere in the building, uh, and... Uh, will be leaving with me, I'm very glad to say, Gayatri. Uh, happy Mother's Day. Uh, it is a happy Mother's Day to you. It's not a happy Mother's Day in Gaza, of course, uh, where literally thousands upon thousands of mothers have been killed along with their children, children burying their mothers. Uh, although a lot of the Mother's Day commemorations uh, today have ignore that fact it's very hard to bear it's very hard to get in the spirit of mother's day when so many mothers are being slaughtered in gaza yes indeed and my uh, my thoughts uh, especially are towards those mothers expecting and due to give birth as you know i'm an advocate for Natural build, I'm really always concerned about the health and well being of uh, mothers to be and the process of giving birth. And I just cannot imagine the pain that giving birth will give in the first place, but then in a war zone plus plus that Gaza is at the moment. It's horrific. It's horrific. Um, and yeah. Tell me. What have you got for us, the social media roundup? Well, uh, the poll uh, asked whether Israel should be banned from the Eurovision Song Contest. And it is clear to say that uh, it's not very popular amongst our audience, this contest. Amongst uh, the patrons, uh, you have Folk Art Fidelity, who says, so Israel are in, but Russia is out. It's a good thing that the Eurovision Song Contest is where culture goes to die, otherwise it'd be a travesty. And Graham Briggs White says, 
Besides Eurovision being banal and totally cheesy, Israel is not and never will be part of Europe. What is needed is a South African approach along with total sanctioning on Israel and a one man, one woman, one vote, an end to apartheid and a one state solution, as you coined the Holy Land, which is a brilliant email and summary from Graham Briggs White. Very brilliant and I'm grateful uh, for it. Uh, I can honestly say, I think, I have never in my entire life watched the Eurovision Song Contest precisely for the reason it is where culture goes to die. It is the ultimate uh, disnification of music, the ultimate banality. Uh, so I would never watch it anyway. But how they can possibly justify putting a non-European country in the contest whilst excluding Europe's largest country, Russia, from the first minute of the war in Ukraine. I just don't know how anyone could justify that, how you'd begin to justify that. No, you can't. Um, and um, to follow up on the comments that you received earlier um, from someone in Amsterdam, as you know, um, the Israel... Um, the, the Holocaust Museum was inaugurated President. today, so you got an email on that. The stupid Dutch invited the president of Israel, Herzog, and even though there were photos of him signing missiles that would be dropped in Gaza. There were, of course, protesters not far from the museum, both pro-Israel and pro-Palestina. And inside, they were all hypocritic, hypocritically repeating, never again. This is from Mari Carmen Passmans. And um, yeah, you know, uh, we have, um, we in the Netherlands, they've all been very actively um, protesting against the visit uh, of Herzog, uh, who was received by the king, yeah, of all. Uh, he, uh, he accommodated uh, this uh, royal visit. Um, uh, and there were all kinds of petitions signed, but to no avail, he was there today. Um, it is incredible. Again, I don't know how you would you know, justify it. I don't know how you say never again when it is actually happening again right now by the people you're saying never again to. It's intellectually impossible to understand how you could justify that. No. Um, here is an email um in regards to the pier that has been proposed to build. Dear George, as an ex-military man, it is my belief that the proposal to build a pier in Gaza does bear ulterior motives. The announcements about it follow the visit of Benny Gantz to both the UK and the US. And another red flag is that the Israelis are publicly happy with the proposal. It's more likely that it's actually going to be a beachhead for the supply of military logistics to support Israel in controlling Gaza and mounting an attack on Lebanon. This is from Pali Scotti, who is a patron and a Workers' Party supporter. And here is a funny joke, suggestion from Scott Latham, who says, I know you have genuine respect and regard for the venerable traditions and achievements of the UK Houses of Parliament, but until better times come, perhaps we should refer to them as the TCCC, also known as Two Cheeks Central Command. A tightly clenched Derriere is another way of putting it. That was, of course, the phrase used Allow by Christopher in. Hitchens, my old foe. He called the American political class a tightly clenched derriere. Very well said, actually. Go ahead. Yeah, allow me to end because you've got callers waiting for you. Allow me to end uh, with what you started with, uh, the Mother's Day, because we received an email um, which says, George and Gayatri, I hope you don't mind, but I borrowed your graphics from the show to make a mock Mother's Day card for my mom and my wife. His wife also being Indonesian, and so their son, Arjuna, a very, very popular Indonesian name, is depicted here. And so he made this for his mother and his wife, very kind. He says, we can't thank you enough for the work you both do. You are connecting great people and great minds across the globe, truly taking concrete steps towards building a fairer, safer, and more just world. Your work is a ray of hope in the darkness that we're surrounded by at the moment. How beautiful, what a beautiful thing to do. Uh, wishing you 
both the mother of all Mother's Days. Thank you, Gayatri. See you after the show. Uh, now, don't forget, you can download the audio version of the Mother of All talk shows in podcast form from wherever you get your podcast from. More and more people are doing it. I hope you'll join them. Uh, on the line in Los Angeles is Nick to talk about Biden and the Pope. Co-religionists, of course, Joe. Uh, Nick, apparently... Apparently, George, and once again, as everybody said, congratulations from here. We've watched your campaign and your success and the mainstream media in the UK completely freaking out as as your voice is now yeah. growing stronger and stronger. So congratulations. God bless you. Uh, yeah, on the... Uh, well, I'll tell you genocide. what, before you, before you go on, Nick, before you go on, I, I had to go for my wife. I don't eat burgers. I had to go for my wife uh, to buy a Smashies burger in Rochdale right before the show. Uh, it's, they're great burgers, by the way. Smashies. Look them up. Uh, I bought her a burger, and when I went in, there was a young fellow sat there waiting for his order. He said, George, man, they're out to get you with pitchforks. That's what it has been like in the mainstream media, as it's called although they don't get enough audience nowadays, truly to be so described. Uh, sorry, Nick, go ahead. No, and on, on that note, George, I follow you somewhat religiously. Um, so I'm following all these attacks that and, and the conversations that are going on throughout the YouTube community, especially from maybe LBC commentators, Nick Ferrari and the gang and yeah. the others, Peter Hitchens, and, you know, ah. the list is endless. So I'm continually fronting them or or confronting them on your behalf as thousands and thousands of people are so so it's working and yeah. and please god it will continue to move forward it seems as though it will the people are ready for it um but going back to our friend genocide joe and as an east end even though i ran away from thatcher's britain in 89 to Los Angeles because I used to be in the entertainment business and I think once upon a time you may have been d even discussed a show that I used to be on because it had a little controversy in the late 80s um, and you were probably in Parliament at the time because it upset Margaret Thatcher but uh, so I ran away from Thatcher's Britain okay. and um, and as an East End Catholic originally I've always been schooled and uh, and and it was always impressed upon me by my parents and family that justice and standing up for those that couldn't stand up for themselves was a core, a core trait of Catholics, working class Catholics. Uh, and what we see in America, in, in, actually predominantly, and I come from an Irish Italian background, um, it's, it's very prevalent and, and common theme with those that seem to have think that they're Irish Americans and so have an affinity or a connection to the Catholic Church, that, that they seem to be the biggest bigots and the worst of all in America, from my perspective as an East End Catholic from the UK. Mm. And, um, and we've got one in the White House. And so the question, that obviously the million dollar question is, and it sort of also may, it, it reminds me of a very famous question time, maybe your last question time appearance when you were attacked in Finchley by a bunch of young Zionists, but there happened to be to your right a, a, a lady who, who professed to be a Catholic. And I always remember you said, please don't touch me when you were being attacked in that studio, that BBC studio. But uh, when, when is the Pope going to come forward and call out Genocide Joe? Because isn't he up for uh, to be held accountable? Especially as Genocide Joe pooped his pants in front of the Pope. Uh, in what was described as a wardrobe incident. I mean, what could be more insulting to His Holiness? The, Joe Biden's a Catholic in the way that Tony Blair is a Catholic. Uh, a Catholic that believes in slaughtering the innocents. A Catholic who offends Catholic doctrine from A to Z, from uh, abortion to... Uh, I'm not smart enough to come up with a Z just like that. The idea that these people are Catholics is monstrous. Monstrous. What would Jesus say? What would St. Peter say about what they do, what they support, what they fund, what they vote for, what they conceal, what they cover up? What kind of a Catholic is Joe Biden 
or Tony Blair. They're a disgrace. They bring disgrace on the Roman Catholic Church. And it's a shame that the hierarchy can't bring themselves openly to say so. Nick, a beautiful call. You've got me intrigued about that series you worked on. Stephen is in Portland in the US on change in the United States. Go ahead, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And God bless you. So, um, Thank you. you know, I'm a baby boomer. Uh, raised on the West Coast of the United States. And, uh, We've lost that one, uh, unfortunately. Hey, we got to 50,000 votes on the poll. Should Israel be banned from the Eurovision Song Contest? 50,542 votes were cast. And overwhelmingly, people voted for a ban on Israel from the Eurovision Song Contest. Now, if journalism existed in Britain, that would be a newsworthy poll. That is the biggest poll on this subject by a country mile that anyone has ever conducted. And the results are utterly overwhelming. Let's take a legend. Last call. It's Norma in Bristol. Norma, happy Mother's Day to you, my dear. Oh, thank you, George. Um, it was my birthday last um, Monday, so I had a very happy birthday instead. Um, I had all my Excellent. friends there. Very good. So I didn't have much today. No, the thing I'm trying to say is, last week, and I wanted to ask you last week, there was the rabbi who was very good, do you remember? And he insinuated... Rabbi that, David, yes. Yeah. He insinuated that some um, Jewish people, the young Jewish um, people, um, they they don't think that Israel should exist. And I was a bit surprised yeah. because although I hate what they're doing in the Israel government and all that with Gaza, surely a reformed Israel should um, continue to exist. It was an odd thing, I thought, really. I wondered what you thought. Uh, he, he wasn't insinuating, uh, Norma. He was quoting from an opinion poll. And in that opinion poll... In that age group, 40% of those believed that Israel should not exist. Just like if mm. you'd had an opinion poll in Britain in the Cold War, uh, should the Soviet Union exist, uh, you would have got a very large number of people voting that it should not. And that would mm. have been a perfectly legitimate opinion. Uh, just mm. like in Scotland, if you uh, were to ask, in an opinion poll tomorrow, uh, should the United Kingdom continue to exist, you get a very large number of people saying no. States don't have a right to exist. States are a political construct uh, which are here today and gone tomorrow. I love Czechoslovakia, but it no longer exists. States exist until they don't exist. What I think you're worried about is any inference that this means the people in that country should not exist. But of course, yeah. that's not at all true. If Scotland left the United Kingdom, the people in England and Wales would continue to exist. It just wouldn't be the United Kingdom anymore. Just like when the Czechs and the Slovaks broke up. The people continued to exist. They just were no longer Czechoslovakians. Last word to you, Norma. Yeah, I realise that. But I suppose inside of me, I thought, well, Israel has... It is a state now, and it's not allied to another one like we are in England, Scotland and Wales, or the Czechs and the Slovaks. And... Um, I just thought, well, it, they, they, they still need to be there, awful that they are. I didn't quite get what you Well, meant. I think the best solution would be for a state of Israel-Palestine to exist. One yeah. state with one vote for every man and woman, Muslim, 
Christian or Jew, uh, living under a constitution guaranteeing yeah. the rights of all. That would be the best uh, way yeah. to yeah, get yeah. out of this jam that we are in. Uh, and uh, as I've said, I would call it the Holy Land. I'd drop the Israel-Palestine and call it the Holy Land of Israel-Palestine. That would be the best solution. But people say, well, what about the two-state solution? I say, what about it? Put it on the table. Let me see it. Produce it. Let's see if it works. But I've got to tell you, Norma, the vast majority of people who say they want a two-state solution are quite confident that no such two-state solution will ever appear. And so I feel very bitter having genuinely supported the Oslo Agreement and the two-state solution for now more than 30 years that we were all hoodwinked, that it was all sand thrown in our eyes. Sorry I've got to cut you off, Norma, because as you can tell, I'm now five whole minutes after uh, the witching hour, and that's going to cost me plenty. Uh, so uh, all I can do is thank Norma for that last call and all the callers who didn't get through, hundreds of them, I want to thank the 50,542 people who voted in our poll. And I want to thank each and every one of you for watching and sharing this material. Please do share it. When you see the clips, share them. When you see the stream on YouTube, please share it. Three million last week. Let's make it three million again, shall we? For the mother of all talk shows. See you on Wednesday, 7 p.m. UK time from London.